Good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Dane Clawson. I'm the executive director of the James Pettis Communication Center and chair of the Department of Communication here at Teal College. We are very excited to have yet another in our series of Pettis Center uh, events. Uh, tonight we have a guest speaker from Duquesne University, Dr. Pamela Walk, and she's going to be talking about as you can see, media portrayals of race and race relations in World War II. Uh, Pamela and I have known each other for a number of years. Uh, she uh, I admitted her to the master's degree program at Point Park University when I was director of the graduate program there. and She was one of my students. Uh, and then I, uh, I left Point Park and she finished her master's degree there and later got a PhD at Ohio University. Uh, and now teaches at Duquesne. So she has an extensive background in the uh, newspaper industry. She was a, a, it worked for newspapers for many years, just like I did. And her last job was at the Savannah Morning News in Savannah, Georgia, which is an excellent mid-city, mid-sized city newspaper. Anyway, without further ado, I will uh, turn it over to Dr. Walk uh, for uh, what should be a stimulating and uh, useful and interesting presentation tonight. So thank, thank you, you for, very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. <clears throat> so before I get started, how many of you are historians or into history? Okay. A little bit tentatively. All right. Just curious about the topic. Yeah. All right. Um, just to kind of springboard off of that, um, the last three years in Savannah, I was actually a military reporter. And I covered uh, the Army's 3rd Infantry Division at Fort Stewart. Um, during that time, there were about three deployments that I got to cover, um, which was always a very interesting experience. And um, for whatever reason, I think that that military theme kind of bled into my research as I went back to grad school, um, and I found it very fascinating. Um, and one of the things that I found so very interesting, and it probably is a thread that weaves through what I'll be talking about today, um, is the fact that you know when we deploy armies to um, nations overseas, a lot of times what happens is that we bring with us um, cultural difficulties, cultural challenges, things that we don't necessarily realize that we have longer ramifications for. Um, when I was covering the 3rd Infantry Division, you know, the big, the big thing that became obvious to me was the fact that we had women um, basically doing door-to-door -door combat with uh, integrated male and female troops in a very, very conservative part of the world. And this was a very different t type of thing. And um, as you'll see tonight, um, really in a lot of ways we had the same kind of um, social, big social issues that were going on, but we weren't necessarily thinking of them that way or talking about them. But that happened during World War II, and it, in particular involving race. So if you would, um, just for a moment, uh, remember the America that was 1942, um, <clears throat> rather than the country we would rather like it to have been. For a while, we would like to believe that ours was a united fight against the tyranny of white supremacy that was spreading across Europe. The harsh reality is that our own government routinely discriminated against men and women of color during World War II. Jim Crow laws and general discriminatory practices in civilian life were commonplace from coast to coast. In the military, this discrimination dictated where one went to basic training. It di dictated where one was stationed and ultimately um, what role one played um, during the war effort. As a result, with very few exceptions, such as the Tuskegee Airmen, most African Americans served in support roles of the great American war machine. They loaded and unloaded shipments at docks. They cooked hot meals, worked the mess halls, and waited on officers' tables. They drove war material and supplies for thousands of miles. And missing from the patriotic narrative of the great American effort to stand up for what President Roosevelt called the four freedoms, freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom from fear, freedom from want, are the untold stories of hundreds of thousands of African Americans who served to preserve those rights for strangers. Um, but yet they were denied those same liberties at home. And part of this was because politicians lacked the ability or sometimes the political will to forge social, social changes. Some military leaders of the day went so far as to declare that wartime was really no time to conduct social experiments, 
um, these policies bred frustration and inequality, so much so that by 1943, the discontentment boiled up and spilled out into American streets in the form of race riots and fighting. What I did not know, but have since discovered, is that the World War II battle space was not immune to these racially based vexations, as our allies in Great Britain are all too keenly aware. For the purposes of this evening, um, I, will be discuss I will be focusing on what um, became sort of the first documented um, incident between black and white American troops on British soil in the autumn of 1942. Um, it was just months after African American troops first deployed to Northern Ireland. Um, I'll be examining how both allied nations approached race and race relations leading up to the American invasion of Great Britain. And I'll also be demonstrating how the media um, reported the deployment of African American troops with examples from both the mainstream press in the US as well as the British press and also looking at the American black press. Um, and I, just a side note, um, I've chosen to use the term African American to describe US troops of African descent who were deployed to England during World War II. Um, and this is really an attempt to just restore dignity. Um, in the words of historian James Campbell, um, you know, for many veterans um, of African American descent, um, they don't conform nicely to the celebrated stories of white heroicism and sacrifice. And terms more commonly used during this period included black, negro, colored, or often worse. And I will only be using those when citing official government reports or uh, mil uh, news articles of the day. So just a little context. In 1922, right after World War I, um, the US Army developed a plan that would influence how African American troops were utilized um, in future conflicts. And this proposal um, really was looking for a continued limitation of maintaining only four all African American army regiments and left the development of what they called Negro National Guard units um, entirely to the individual states. Um, and it was a plan that was also called for assigning white officers to all black units, maintaining separate facilities in terms of training, and capping what they called Negro manpower to 10.73% of the entire military. Their rationale behind this was that it would reflect the, um, breakdown of the, the racial breakdown of the American population during this time period. So by 1937, uh, military leaders were revisiting the issue of military manpower and concluded that, quote, failure to provide large percentages of Negroes in initial mobilization would result in the repetition of mistakes made in World War I, end quote. Among other topics discussed and addressed by the revised plan were the expectations of low African American intelligence testing scores that would require larger percentages of African American population to be drafted in hopes of filling all the positions that they had. So between September of 1939 and the Japanese bombing of Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941, the US Army grew exponentially. And with that growth came an increase in the number of African American soldiers among the ranks. They started out with barely 4,000 soldiers, and by the end of that time period, there were 98,000. One historian noted that by the end of America's first year of participating in World War II, the number of African Americans in the US Army totaled over 467,000. Adding to the challenge of this massive growth was the Army policy to maintain a separate but equal approach to training, meaning that it would accept African Americans into the military branch as long as it was in segregated facilities and in direct proportion to that of the general po black civilian population. In other words, US military installations needed two of everything to accommodate both white and African American troops. That included dance halls, and rec recreational facilities at home as well as overseas. In, um, and despite the randomness of conscription, the Army would only allow African Americans to make up 10% of its population because that was the, reflected the racial makeup of the, of the country at the time. And things were not much better for African Americans in other branches of the US Armed Forces. The US Navy maintained a very limited number of African Americans among its ranks, and those who did serve were largely limited to stewards' positions on ships. The US Marine Corps, the smallest of the American Armed Forces, blatantly opposed the admission of African Americans initially, and while the Army Air Force initially blocked, then they later followed the Army's lead um, in its segregation policy. 
So these race policies created difficulties that were peculiar to Negro units. For example, policies dictated that in addition to African Americans training at separate facilities, um, from those of their white peers, based on the experience of World War I, African American units could not be commanded by black officers for fear that enlisted men would not listen to their racial peers as officers. Military policies also forbade black officers to outrank white field officers in any particular unit. As a result, white officers, often from the South, were placed in command of black troops, which caused friction in the rank and file. Here we see a group of soldiers in formation and uh, a white officer is, is standing with them. This separate but equal approach became a sticking point between the Secretary of War, Henry Stimson, who argued that wartime was no time to begin using the Army as, quote, a sociological laboratory for effecting social change within the military establishment, end quote. And his civilian aide, William H. Hastie, an African-American who advocated in integrating smaller African-American units into larger all-white ones. Hastie further argued that, quote, the policy of assigning most black soldiers to menial duties should be stopped, end quote, and contended that segregation remained, quote, the most dramatic evidence of hypocrisy in our profession that we are girding ourselves for the preservation of democracy, end quote. It should be noted that many of Hasey's suggestions were adopted by the end of the war, despite initially being panned by white officials at the time when he proposed them. American troops marchi marching in formation through the streets of Belfast were a welcome sight to the war-weary citizens of Northern Ireland, also known as Ulster, in late January 1942. Newspapers ra that rarely ran photographs during the war years where paper was rationed, suddenly dedicated dozens of column inches to images showing the arrival of the Yanks. In the far right image, we see um, a cheeky American soldier standing on a ladder trying to woo an Ulster woman who's leaning out of the second floor window. Newspaper editors labeled him as, quote, an American Romeo attempting his first conquest of war while other images feature the profile of a U.S. soldier just over to the left in the middle there, um, kind of chomping down on a big fat cigar as he surveyed his new surroundings. These editorials breathlessly praised the speed of the Americans, whose president just three weeks earlier had promised manpower to his nation's new ally after the country was drawn into World War II. It was as if the British Isles had suddenly taken a collective sigh of relief. The first African-American troops would not land in Northern Ireland for another six months. Unlike their white counterparts, the arrival of African-American troops would not be heralded in the British press, nor would Ulster newspapers dedicate column inches to stories and photographs documenting their <coughs> arrival or recording their romantic wartime conquests. To be fair, the British press, um, to be fair to the British press, it had been regularly reporting the arrival of American troops, and their coverage had slowly tapered off by the time the first ship of African-American soldiers mobilized to Northern Ireland in the summer of 1942. The American press, on the other hand, briefly noted that African-American troops ha had deployed to Europe for the first time since World War I. This was big news. The New York Times ran a photo across the top of page 8 in its July 29th, 1942 edition. Similarly, the Chicago Defender ran a photo documenting the deployment of African American troops in the newspaper's July 25th, 1942 edition. Both images featured a platoon-sized unit of African Americans interacting with British allies, and neither photo named the soldiers or their units, as unit identification would have run counter to censorship regulations. But the similarities between the photographs really ends there. The Times image depicts here we see is depicting a platoon standing around a refreshment table in Northern Ireland shortly after landing. Two white Ulster volunteers are pushed to the far right corner of the frame and they appeared to be observers rather than participants. The soldiers, meanwhile, look frightened and uncertain. It's a stark contrast to the photos of their white compatriots who had arrived triumphantly months earlier and paraded down the main streets of Belfast. The New York Times image is also starkly different from what ran in the weekly black press publication, the Chicago Defender. 
in a newspaper that routinely featured stories and images of African Americans participating in the war effort, this image ran across four columns on the top of the page. And while it also featured a platoon-sized unit of soldiers, the composition is quite different. In this picture, the troops are engaged in conversation with a corporal with the British Army Royal Air Force. Everyone is smiling as the white airman shows off a piece of equipment that was captured from the Germans. It's a spoil of war. The men appear to be comfortable and at ease with each other. The image reaffirmed to the defenders, African American readers, that there was no color bar in Britain and that the men deployed there were enjoying a life not possible back home in the States. These images were hidden from view for a majority of Ulster citizens. Instead, thousands of African American troops quietly dispersed across Northern Ireland and into villages scattered across England, practically doubling the small island nation's minority population overnight. Some estimate the British Isles African descendant population at around 8,000 prior to the war and largely concentrated in port cities. For many African Americans, especially from southern states, the deployment would be the first time that they were in a society where Jim Crow laws did not dictate the boundaries of everyday life. For their white American counterparts, deployment became a frustration as they saw African Americans stepping out with British women and in many instances being treated better by their British hosts, breeding hostilities amongst the segregated camps. And for Ulster citizens, particularly Irish Catholics, the arrival of African American troops to Northern Ireland in the autumn of 42 represented an opportunity to passively defy the crown by socially engaging with them, much to the dismay of British and American officials. The shiny veneer of the American invasion did not last long in some quarters of the British government. By June 1942, British, British officials in the Colonial Office, the Foreign Office, and the Home Office were all voicing serious concerns about the implications of the Americans stationed in the British Isles. Of particular concern, the number of African American troops en route and how racial tensions among Americans might influence British society. Fears quickly became reality from Northern Ireland across the British Isles. One colonial office official noted to a colleague on June 24th, 1942, quote, I hear through a liaison officer with the Americans that they, white U.S. soldiers, are taking a threatening attitude about the blacks and colored people they find over here. They were proud of having beaten up one, apparently an American Negro who, quote, gave himself airs at some entertainment. The official added that there had also been growing talk among the Americans that they would lynch anyone of African descent seen dancing with white girls. He noted, quote, allowances must be made for loose talk, of course, but I fear that there may be a nasty situation brewing up. The officials concluded that as a matter of imperial policy, quote, we cannot encourage a color bar or tolerate outrages on blacks. It did not take long for these nasty situations to start popping up across a small nation. John L. Keith, a welfare officer in the colonial office, had noted just a few days later that a white American soldier had publicly insulted a former serviceman from West India, an incident that had resulted in a police report. Keith further noted, there is, to my knowledge, apprehension among colored colonial people in this country about the generally rude attitude of American soldiers take towards them and it is clear to me that the presence of American troops in any service hostel makes impossible the entry of colonial servicemen. A month later, Keith wrote to Sir Charles Jeffries in the colonial office at Whitehall, noting that the large number of African American troops in the UK was, quote, having repercussions on our work for colored colonial people, and the treatment of Am the Americans met out to their Negroes is a subject of comment by colored colonials, end quote. Keith noted that during a conversation with African American troops stationed in Liverpool, he had been told that white Americans were preventing them from using the same places for entertainment when they were given passes off post. American commanders had suggested pres presentations to British military staff explaining the complex race issue back in the U.S., prompting Keith to note to his colleagues, quote, any discriminatory treatment of colored persons in this country is bound to react on the work we are trying to do to break down the color bar and to help colored people in this country fit into the work and life of this country. I do not understand references to lectures to be given by Americans on the color question. It would be very undesirable for the Americans to lecture British people on color bar. 
I think in our interest, we should press the Americans to provide very fully for leave, recreation, sports, et cetera, for their Negroes. And we should suggest to them that they might seek our assistance and that of other persons and agencies to provide suitable hospitality, and et cetera, end quote. He concluded by observing, rather prophetically as it would turn out, that any attempt by the Americans to segregate troops would result in British citizens developing a strong resentment towards their allies. But these mounting concerns were not limited to the colonial office. By July of 1942, just a month after African American troops first started arriving, similar concerns about race and race relations began to arrive in the form of letters to the British Home Office from chief constables across the country as the number of American troops arriving in the British Isles kept in increasing. Oxfordshire's chief constable, in a letter to Frank, Sir Frank Newsom, the British Under Secretary of State in the Home Office, complained that neither the Home Office nor the War Office had established a policy regarding African American troops in the UK. And in discussions with colleagues in the southern part of the country, there were growing concerns, quote, that serious clashes are likely to occur between American white troops and American colored troops unless definite regulations are laid down in order to segregate these persons when off duty. End quote. The constable added that it was his opinion that if left to themselves, the African American troops would be fine, but that, quote, the American white troops will create trouble if it is found that the colored troops are associating with white civilians, and in particular with white girls, end quote. By August 1942, a confidential memo entitled USA Colored Troops was circulating among members of the Home Office and the, co the country's regional commissioners drafted by Harry Haig, a regional commissioner for the Southern Regional Headquarters. The two-page report outlined how the presence of African-American troops in the UK and their interactions with British civilians could stir up problems among American troops and urged a nationwide under educational undertaking. Haig noted that while waiting for American military officials to make a final decision on its policy regarding troops, public complaints about incidents could develop, adding, quote, if, therefore, we do not want to see criticism of the American authorities develop, it would be wise to do a little educating of our population in the history and facts of the colored problem in the USA. It is suggested that discreet propaganda should be put about in the areas where colored troops are intended to be stationed, primarily intended to reach the girls." End quote. Haig's report went on to outline the contents of the propaganda piece which regional commissioners envisioned would include a, quote, sympathetic historical statement about how African Americans arrived in the United States, the experience U.S. leaders had when attempting to, quote, mix the races, and the general societal difficulties that resulted. Haig's proposal noted, quote, the races are different in character and education and outlook, and intimacy in the end means trouble. Do not treat them in any way as outcasts. Be helpful, be kind, but not intimate, end quote. Two days after Haig's memorandum began to circulate among the regional commissioners, an unnamed official from the Bristol area offered his opinion on how the Home Office should proceed. He noted, in this region, we have had some experience of the colored problem, and it is true that our experience has been very limited, and that up to the date, no serious incidents have occurred. There is, however, definite pointers to the fact that unless something is done about the whole matter, we shall have incidents, and that if they multiply, they may represent in bulk a very serious problem." End quote. The official noted that, the, broad and large, the majority of citizens in the area had no idea the presence of African American troops could present any problems. Further, the unnamed author felt that extending hospitality to African American troops was not a concern, but rather of greater concern was shielding more vulnerable citizens from them. Specifically, the official feared that lower class women, who perhaps did not know better, could be easily taken advantage of by African American troops who, with deep pockets to woo women, also purchased bicycles to allow them greater mobility in the countryside. He noted, quote, and there is no doubt that a very large number of girls, some of them outwardly of respectable class, are, not, are now walking out with colored troops, end quote. Adding to his personal frustration was that many of the women were really just girls between the ages of 16 and 18, and they were no longer under the organizational control of schools or social groups that Haig's proposal intended to target with a word-of-mouth propaganda campaign. As such, he concluded by urging the Home Office to use haste in putting together a plan.
He said, quote, I should like to emphasize the need for speed. Broad and large, the darky is a simple-minded child. But like other children, if you give him an inch, he will take an L. And once he has taken an L, the trouble will have started. We have in the regions been presented by the government with a tar baby and no sort of guidance as to how to cr the creature is to be nourished, educated, or controlled. Somebody at the top has got to have the guts to give us a guidance so that we may proceed upon a level and considered national policy. The matter is of some urgency in order that we may prevent calamities which will become apparent in nine months' time with all their consequences." End quote. Some pretty harsh words. Frank Newsom's August 31st, 1942 letter to Eisenhower, the highest ranking U.S. official in the Eastern, in the European theater of operation, was framed as being written as a courtesy that was certainly owing to the commanding general of American troops in Britain before the country's constables and police departments were presented with the informational circular. But rather than raising the much dis Gus' concerns about biracial births, the dangers of street fracases, and fears of building resentments among British civilians, Newsom instead used an incident in Liverpool to explain why British officials felt strongly about enforcing their country's policy of non-discrimination in public places. He noted, quote, certain incidents have been reported to us which, in our view, make it desirable to issue instructions to the police on, in this matter. For example, there was one incident towards the end of July when white American seamen and soldiers resented the association of British women with colored American troops. The situation became so menacing and ugly that the police on the spot decided to part the soldiers and the girls in their own interests. One police officer spoke to the girls while another police officer pointed out to the colored American soldiers that their association with white women seemed objectionable to white American troops and that in their own interest it would be much better if they and the girls parted company. The colored soldiers resented being spoken to on this matter by the British police and one of them replied, it is not democracy if we cannot do what we like, end quote. Eisenhower's acting chief of staff, Brigadier General John E. Dalquest, responded three days later saying, quote, the commanding general is in complete accord with the instructions the Home Office proposes to issue. This policy of non-discrimination is exactly the policy which has always been followed by the U.S. Army, end quote. He also noted that U.S. Army officials had a policy that if a particular place was out of bounds for some U.S. soldiers, it was considered out of bounds for all U.S. soldiers and Army personnel. Indeed, shortly after the arrival of African-American troops to the British Isles, the U.S. Army's Adjutant General's Office issued what it called a policy on Negroes to the Commanding General and Service of Supply Staff in the ETO that essentially placed the responsibility of maintaining peaceful race relations among U.S. troops on their own commanding officers. Lieutenant Colonel Fred Meyer, the Assistant Adjutant General, wrote at the command of Eisenhower, quote, it is the it is the desire of this headquarters that discrimination against the Negro troops should be seditiously avoided. Although Eisenhower and the Adjutant General's office were well aware that commanders of white and African American soldiers stationed in camps near smaller towns might find it difficult to give equal accommodation, especially when dances and socials were concerned, the commanders were expected to use their best judgment in avoiding discrimination due to race, but at the same time minimize causes of friction between white and colored troops. These policies and pronouncements made it clear that headquarters command, at least, expected each commander to do his part in ensuring that troops deployed to Great Britain would behave themselves. If there was any questions as about how to behave in theater, the ETO also issued a memorandum to commanders and leaders of African American troops explaining the sensitivity of the issue, noting that one in 10 American soldiers were minorities. It added, quote, colored Americans along with all others have been taught the national ideals of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States. Limitations of their civilian activities and opportunities contrary to those ideals growing out of custom and personal beliefs concerning group differences have no place in our army life. So far as they involve discrimination on basis of race or color, they are contrary to specific provisions of selective service legislatives and they are fatal to military efficiency." End quote. The memo to commanders of African American troops argued that in the name of military efficiency, teamwork would be required of everyone, and noted that as commanding general of the ETO, Eisenhower sincerely hoped that, quote, every soldier returning to the homeland will take back this comradeship, mutual respect, and the spirit of helpfulness developed during his service with us, end quote. 
The memorandum concluded by announcing that Brigadier General Benjamin O. Davis, Sr., who at the time was the U.S. Army's only African-American general officer, he's pictured here, had been tasked with commanding a special section that would be responsible for investigating and adjusting problems which may arise in connection with the command and leadership of our colored troops, end quote. It did not take long for many of the citizens of Northern Ireland to develop a preference among the American troops. One Northern Ireland member of parliament, Dame Deidre Parker, noted in a letter to the assistant secretary to the cabinet secretariat that in her district of Moneymore, quote, the colored men are well looked after, end quote. In fact, she stated the African-American troops were probably better looked after than their white compatriots in towns to the west of Belfast. She added, quote, Apart from the feelings of the troops concerned, the whole situation is bad. Our people do not understand and seem to prefer the black to the white. I'm told that this applies particularly to the RC, Roman Catholic, population, and of course, the lowest class of white girl." End quote. Parker's comments reinforced some of the primary fears that British officials in the Home Office, the Colonial Office, and the Regional Commissioners had expressed amongst themselves throughout the summer of 42. However, unlike officials in Whitehall who feared illegitimate biracial births and the social consequences of intimacy with African American troops, Parker's comments about the Northern Irish Roman Catholics' preference for African American troops hinted at a more serious concern that was exclusive to Northern Ireland, the festering tensions between the Catholics and the Protestants. Historian Simon Topping noted, Northern Ireland was also, in effect, a single party state dominated by Unionists, the Protestants, which excluded the Irish nationals, or the Catholic minority, from government and discriminated against them in everyday life. Elements within this minority who viewed the partition of the island as illegal periodically destabilized the state, notably during a spat of terrorist attacks in 1942. To be sure, reports of sectarian violence in the forms of car bombs and shootings by members of the Irish Republican Army reached the American press during the fall of 42. Toppings argued that it was this disparity in the treatment of Irish Catholics by their unionist government that prompted many citizens in Northern Ireland to passively defy the government by engaging in friendships with African American troops, knowing full well that the officials in Westminster disapproved of such behavior. Despite this effort to establish ground rules, the reality is that many African American soldiers in the British Isles struggled when off duty. Here, um, I found a letter from an unnamed soldier to officials at Stormont, which was Northern Ireland's political offices. He wrote, quote, I'm an American colored soldier. My group of fellows have been stationed here in Antrim for nine months. We are trying to do our part in the fight for freedom, but since we have been here, we have met so much segregation, prejudice, and strife Sometimes we doubt the Allied cause. He added, quote, we hate to walk the streets of Belfast merely because we are insulted. They use words, nigger and darky. Those are two words that we hate. Those words were brought here by the American whites. The American whites taught the people those words in order to start strife and envy among us and the people. On August 21st, 1942, the Belfast newspaper editors were called into a meeting with Stormont officials and British troops Northern Ireland Lieutenant Colonel Turnham to discuss the steps being taken by U.S. commanders to encourage better understanding of the British troops, to address the differences in prevailing attitudes toward African American service members, and to talk about concerns that the disparity in salaries between Americans and British troops might prompt. Based on the topics of discussion in the meeting minutes, it is clear that British officials were concerned that it was more of a matter of when and less a question of if something would happen among the U.S. troops. According to Stormont's account of the meeting, Colonel Turnham, addressing his remarks to the editors, asked for their aid in, quote, playing down, end quote, incidents that may occur, which were not serious in themselves, but which, by undue publicity, could be played up by their enemies in order to strain relationships between the two countries. He stated that the incidents so far reported had been handled with great discretion by the newspapers, and he hoped that the authorities could depend on the newspapers to use their influence to foster good relations between the two forces. The British officer argued that because little of significance was happening on the battlefront, readers would be more focused on the small incidents that sprang up between Allied forces, but that, quote, when the war activity became more marked, end quote, the attention would lessen. 
It should be noted that British wartime censorship was much more severe than what was found in the United States during World War II, where American editors and publishers agreed to what was called a voluntary domestic censorship. The British press saw the war being, quote, a great self-abdination of power by the press. British press historian Mick Temple noted more recently that the British government's wartime censorship practices went much deeper. By 1940, the draconian Regulation 2D, quote, gave government the right to ban publication of materials or publications prejudicial to national interests. Those accused had no right of appeal on the law, and inevitably, comparisons with Nazi Germany were made by opponents, end quote. In addition to government officials holding the right to shut down publications, Temple also noted that it was common for British censors to cut articles out of publications arriving in Great Britain from the United States because of questionable content. This heavy-handed approach to the press during the war years meant that it was not uncommon for British government and military officials to hold meetings with the country's newspaper editors and publishers to request tempered approaches to stories. So such was the case in August of 42 when, the, the meet, when they met in Northern Ireland. Stormont officials later reported, quote, the newspaper representatives, representatives present, present assured Colonel Turnham that they would do everything possible to encourage a better understanding between the two forces and would deal with great discretion with stories that might occur regarding friction between men of the two armies, end quote. This resolve was tested nine days later in the village of Antrim, just 18 miles north of Belfast. The first casualty of racial unrest among American troops in the ETO was of Private William C. Jenkins, who died of knife wounds he sustained on the evening of September 30th, 1942, in the village of Antrim. The incident involved what would become the hallmarks of future incidences between African American and white U.S. troops deployed to the U.K. It was a deadly mix of alcohol, prejudice, and white military police. The Belfast Telegraph, which was the first newspaper to name Jenkins as a victim, published on the afternoon of October 1st, 1942. The nine-paragraph story ran down a single column on page three, sandwiched between a story about the Russians advancing on Stalingrad and another involving a shooting incident with the IRA in Belfast. The Telegraph noted that Jenkins, an African-American, was, quote, stabbed to death during a, a disturbance in the streets of Antrim about nine o'clock on Wednesday night, end quote. The article noted that an unnamed white soldier was also injured. The report described the incident, noting that Jenkins was among a group of U.S. soldiers who, quote, came under the notice of a U.S. military patrol, end quote. When the MPs ordered the men to return to camp, the newspaper reported, the soldiers refused. A disturbance ensued and prompted gunfire. Once calm had been restored, Jenkins was discovered, quote, lying in a pool of blood, knifed to death, end quote. The Telegraph's report also quoted from a press release issued by the ETO Northern Ireland headquarters that described a scene where several shots were fired, but made a point to clarify that Ulster citizens were not involved in the incident. The only time race is identified in the news report is in terms of the individuals fatally injured or with serious injuries. The rest of the report is left to the reader to determine if the group of soldiers ordered back to their barracks were all African American. Likewise, it is up to the audience to conclude conclude that the MPs making the orders were white. A day after the Telegraph's report, the Irish News published a five-paragraph news story anchored on the bottom right-hand corner of the front page. The headline declared in all capital letters, American soldier killed in Antrim street fracas. They like the word fracas a lot. <laughs> The New York Times, or the Irish News rather, relied heavily on the official press release leading a short story with a verbatim republishing of the U.S. military's official description of the incident. The paper went on to explain that the press association learned that, quote, a U.S. soldier killed, the U.S. soldier killed was Negro while the wounded so soldier is a white man, end quote. The Irish News expanded the story by reporting that the incident occurred outside of a public house in Antrim, which is where Jenkins and the group of men were approached by the MPs. Again, racial descriptors were missing from the rest of the account, leaving audience members to reach their own conclusions about the races of the other individuals involved. Among the mainland British newspapers, the London Times was the only other British news organization to report the Antrim incident. The two-paragraph brief under the headline, U.S. Soldier Killed in Antrim, appeared on October 2, 1942, in the middle column of the bottom of page two. 
From the wording, it is apparent that, that the Times pulled the story off of the press wires or from a wired copy of the ETO Northern Ireland headquarters press release. It cited the official statement and noted it had been issued a day earlier. There was no acknowledgment of race nor any mention of the pub and the possible role that alcohol might have played in the fracas. On the Times editorial page, editors pontificated on growing anxiety over coal supplies in London and the rest of the country as they were preparing for winter, while staff columnists expanded on the growing disunity in India. However, at the very bottom of the editorial page, a letter to the editor carried the headline, Colored Soldiers. Written by D. Davy Diston, a snack bar manager for a shop located in Oxford, the author wrote that the shop's employees felt compelled to comment on the current state of affairs in England particularly surrounding the issue of race. Davy Diston described how an African-American soldier had come into the store the night before carrying a note from his commander. In the note, the commander begged the shop owner to look after the soldier who was responsible for running supplies across the country and often missed regular meals and was having difficulty securing food off post. The letter writer noted, quote, naturally we looked after him to the best of our ability but I could not help feeling ashamed that in a country where even stray dogs are, quote, looked after by special societies, a citizen of the world who is fighting the world's battle for freedom and equality should, be found, should have found it necessary to place himself in this humiliating position. Had there been the slightest objection from other customers, I should not have had any hesitation in asking them all to leave. News of the Antrim incident traveled quickly. The New York Times, the Washington Post, and the Detroit Free Press all published wire stories of the incident on Friday, October 2nd, 1942. That was the same day that the news hit the London Times. The Chicago Tribune um, reported the Antrim Street fight more than a week after the fact. Among the mainstream newspapers I examined, these four publications were the only ones to report the first major racial incident among US troops deployed during World War II. Three of the four newspapers noted the racial identities of the men involved. In a newspaper that claimed to publish all the news fit to print, the New York Times turned to the United Press wire services for its source on the Northern Ireland incident. Under headline declaring, U.S. soldier killed in brawl in Ireland, the Times noted that the subhead, in the subhead that an African-American soldier was stabbed to death during an altercation where military police were involved. The Wire story noted that witnesses reported multiple shots had been fired, prompting residents to flee the town. The story also expanded what was written in the British press when it reported that several soldiers were arrested. The story noted, quote, the argument was reported to have started as Negro troops left the pub. The military police rushed up, but the Negroes refused to disperse and the police were forced to draw their revolvers, end quote. The story concluded with the same statement reported by the British press issued directly from the ETO Northern Ireland headquarters, including the fact that civilians were not injured in the incident and that the lack of acknowledgement by military officials of the race of soldiers involved in the fracas or the role race might have played in the event. It should be noted that the New York Times story did not identify either of the soldiers by name. For even careful readers of the Washington Post, they might have overlooked the two paragraph brief that was published on October 2nd on page four about the soldier killed in Antrim. The last brief in half a column of war sidelights, the International News Ser Service wire story was whittled down to two paragraphs under the headline, Yank Killed in Ireland. The races of the soldiers involved in the brawl were omitted from the report. Instead, instead, readers would only learn that one U.S. soldier was, quote, stabbed to death and another shot seriously in an altercation with military police in the streets of Antrim, end quote. And while the brief noted that it was an order from MPs for the U.S. troops to return to their barracks that prompted the fight, there was no indication the military police officers were white, nor was it acknowledged that the soldiers refusing their orders were African American. Again, neither the killed soldier nor the injured one was named. The Pittsburgh Courier, the Chicago Defender, and the Baltimore Afro-American all reported the stabbing death of an African American soldier in Northern Ireland. All three newspapers with weekly publications on Saturdays had just missed the, getting the news into their papers the first weekend of October. The Courier and the Defender both reported the news on October 10th. The Afro-American published the following week. 
And while all three black presses utilized wire services, the manner in which the news was reported, both in terms of headlines and placement on pages, varied. It should also be noted that all three publications were limited to either the Associate, Associated Negro Press, or ANP, or the National Negro Publishers Association, um, the NNPA, because they were banned from membership in mainstream wire services such as the AP or Reuters News Service. In the defender's description of the altercation, racial identifiers were not used, leaving readers to guess that the soldiers were most likely African American, while the MPs were most likely white. Again, there's no mention of the name of the soldier who was killed, nor the soldier that was seriously injured. Flanked at the top and bottom with the courier's double victory campaigns, double V, the unidentified wire report is nearly identical to the UP wire story that appeared in the New York Times a week earlier. But where the Times used the term Negro to refer to African American soldiers, the courier edited the, edited the copy to say, quote, colored. The Afro American was the last of the newspapers to report the Antrim incident. In an ANP wire story published at the bottom of page three on October 17th, the story was nearly identical to the brief published the same day in The Defender. With one exception, the Afro American did not call the fight a melee. Instead, the brief concluded, quote, Private Jenkins was a victim of knife wounds. Again, the role that race might have played in the incident was stripped out of the wire story, although the influence of alcohol as a potential accelerant in the street fight was retained. The only other mention of the Antrim incident in the Baltimore-based newspaper came in the form of a front page story, also published October 11th. 1942 by wartime correspondent Ollie Stewart, who had attended a press conference held by Brigadier General Benjamin O. Davis. As the U.S. Army's only African American general officer, Davis had been tasked just a month earlier with overseeing race issues in the ETO after conducting similar inspections of African American troop conditions in basic training camps and Army installations across the United States during the first half of 42. This is uh, Davis in uh, London in 42. Davis's ETO post inspections and tours of the working conditions of African American soldiers began immediately. In fact, he was in England only a matter of days when the Antrim incident prompted a visit to Northern Ireland, where he conducted an investigation on behalf of the Army. Historian Marvin Fletcher noted, he talked with American soldiers and policemen and Irish civilians. The news of Davis's work quickly reached the American black press, whose members were able to reassure their readers that Davis was on the scene investigating problems. After finishing his work, he left for England on the evening of 8 October. He submitted a report to General Lee on the murder of the black soldier. The SOS commander was impressed with the work and asked Davis to accompany him on another inspection tour. The significance of Davis's inspection tour of Northern Ireland operations and the subsequent investigation into the murder of Private Jenkins is, is substantial because it in part demonstrates that U.S. military leaders were aware of how volatile race relations among American troops had become in a very short amount of time. And it also reveals that Eisenhower and his command staff had been proactive in attempting to resolve these matters rather than reactionary to increasing racial tensions. This timeline of Davis's arrival in the UK also counters British historians, both Simon Toppings and Graham Smith, who both argued that the US military's only African American general officer was dispatched to the British Isles because of the incident at Antrim. Topping, describing Davis's work in the ETO, wrote, quote, General Benjamin O. Davis examined interracial violence on and or near military bases in the United States and was sent to the UK in the wake of the events of Antrim. End quote. Smith, more than two decades earlier, claimed, quote, the growing problem of clashes between black and white GIs in Britain, and in particular the death of a black soldier in Antrim, Northern Ireland, persuaded the Army to offer Davis a unique role. He was charged by Eisenhower to conduct an investigation into racial friction in Britain, end quote. While it is true that Davis spent the first half of 1942 troubleshooting racial issues in the U.S., investigating incidents at military installations from Camp Livingston, Louisiana, to Fort Dix, New Jersey, he was already in the U.K., essentially continuing the same work when the Antrim murder occurred. If anything, it could be argued that Davis's presence in England, combined with the unfortunate timing of the incident between white and African-American troops in Antrim shortly after his arrival, only served as a reinforcement that the U.S. military had much more work to do in terms of handling race relations among its own troops. <laughs>
race nearly from the onset of the U.S. De troops deployment to Great Britain was of great concern both to British and American officials, but the reasons for concern were quite different. For British officials, race relations was an added layer of nuance that began with general consternation over the differences between the two nations and their troops. American soldiers came to the British Isles better dressed, better paid, and better supplied in terms of food as well as war material. These facts, combined with the romantic notions fed to British society through Hollywood films about how glamorous Americans were, meant that jealousy on the part of British soldiers would almost inevitably spark conflict between the men, adding to the concern were men acting out of line merely because it was wartime and they were far from home. Racial differences only added to uh, British officials' concern, particularly where their women folk were concerned. Fears of a sudden influx of illegitimate mixed race war babies prompted the Home Office to launch a word of mouth campaign among women's groups urging British women to avoid intimate relationships with American troops, particularly African American soldiers. British officials also struggled to explain the American attitude towards African Americans to a nation that had little exposure <coughs> to people of African or Caribbean descent. This difficulty was only complicated by Britain's vast holdings across the globe in the form of colonies where people of color were the majority and an imbalance of policies created similar situations to the institution of Jim Crow laws in the American South. American officials, particularly military leaders, were also keenly aware of the potential problem matters of race could present to their troops deployed overseas. As early as 1940, President Roosevelt in an attempt to appease the African-American population and garner their votes, appointed Judge Hastings, the dean of uh, Howard University's law school, as a civilian aide to the Secretary of War, Henry Stimson. Two years later, while he was setting up, while setting up his command in the ETO, Eisenhower appointed Davis as a commander of a special section in the Inspector General's office that would be tasked with investigating and and quote, adjusting problems which may arise in connection with the command and leadership of our colored troops, end quote. Eisenhower seemed convinced, perhaps rather naively, that the strong guidance and discipline enforced by a capable army officer leadership from second lieutenant all the way up to general could ensure that white and African-American soldiers would put their domestic differences aside for the greater good of the war effort. Further, he was convinced that in so doing, quote, every soldier returning to the homeland will take back this comradeship, mutual respect, and the spirit of helpfulness developed during his service with us, end quote. His dream of bringing racial harmony to the United States through the institution of the U.S. Army was a lofty and unattainable goal ahead of its time. In terms of how the media reported race and race relations, several, several trends emerged. Perhaps most noteworthy was that the Belfast Telegraph, a unionist paper or Protestant, was the first publication to name Private William Jenkins as a victim of the stabbing um, sparked by racial violence in the streets of Antrim. It would be a full week later before other newspapers, including those in the U.S., would report the soldier's name after the ETO USA issued a statement releasing Jenkins' name. In reporting the soldier's name first, the Telegraph demonstrated the most independent reporting among the newspapers. Rather than relying on the ETO USA press release about the incident, Telegraph staff conducted independent research and learned the soldier's name in time for the next day's newspaper deadline. This was a bold move, especially considering that just nine days earlier, Lieutenant Colonel Turnham, the BTNI commander, had gathered the local newspaper editors and urged them to exercise restraint in terms of how they reported racial incidents. It would seem that, in this instance at least, the Telegraph defied those orders and demonstrated the hallmarks of a free press despite wartime in terms of reporting the incident. Ironically, the Irish News, which did not send editors to that meeting, essentially published the ETO USA press release verbatim. In terms of the American black press, the same weekend that the London Times and the New York Times were reporting the initial incident, Defender correspondent George Padmore had a front page column addressing the growing concern about race relations among the Americans deployed to the UK. Padmore's censored dispatch reported, quote, more and more each day the entire question of race prejudice and US pressure to extend discrimination to the British Isles is coming realistically to the fore here, end quote. While his column was not unlike others in competing newspapers, 
Padmore did write rather tongue-in-cheek when he noted that certain topics are more easily passed through wartime censors than others. He continued, quote, while yet no official ruling has been made to lay off color bar difficulties, the trouble I have experienced in transmitting such information clearly indicates that the subject is disliked, end quote. One thing is clear, as early as October 1942, British and American newspapers were at the mercy of wartime censors and military officials when it came to sensitive information involving U.S. troops and race relations. For newspapers local to the incident, as was demonstrated in Antrim, a greater level of autonomy was achieved with independent news reporting routines evident, including investigative efforts to secure the names of victims and details about how the role race played in the incident. Another clear lesson from Antrim was that unlike the American press, which was heavily divided among racial fault lines based solely on skin color, the British press clearly saw the frame of American as a racial identifier. To the British press and its readers, the term American clearly meant both ethnicity and race. And in conclusion, I feel it should be noted that by the time World War II ended in 1945, the American troops were serving side by side their white peers in allied foxholes. The demands of total war ultimately proved too powerful for the separate but equal mentality U.S. government and military officials had stubbornly clung to when the country first entered the war. It also marked a turning point for the U.S. military, putting a permanent fissure in misguided arguments against social experimentation during wartime by ultimately pushing an institution steeped in tradition into decidedly new territory as a forerunner of social integration in America as early as 1948. To be sure, it would take more, two more decades for African Americans to see American society take more permanent steps toward racial equality. But even in those earliest days of war, one editorial letter writer to the Pittsburgh Courier noted that he saw glimmers of hope that the United States could become the shining light of democracy for all. So that is all that I have, and I would be happy to take questions. <laughs> yeah. Uh, did you find any, any mention of this in any of the uh, biographies or autobiographies written by American journalists or British journalists? The Antrim incident? Yes. Um, or just race re coverage of race relations and during the war? And no, I read, um, no, I read, uh, a, there's a really great uh, book that came out recently, actually. They found the war diaries of um, a reporter who started out with the Pittsburgh Courier and then went to the Chicago Defender. Um, and now his name is totally escaping me. Uh, I have to get back to it. Anyways, he had kept a war journal, and he was actually in London in 43, 44, right before the invasion of Normandy. And he talks a lot in his diary about race relations because he um, had written a lot about race relations, had written books about it, and was part of the Harlem Renaissance era. And so I definitely saw stuff there. But part of the reason that you didn't see a lot of... Um, white journalists writing about it was that even the um, war correspondents were segregated. So only um, African-American journalists were with African-American troops and white journalists were with white troops. So it was a completely segregated experience. Any other questions? Uh -huh. What makes you pick relations in, uh, between races in Britain as opposed to, say, Britain in particular? Um, well, there are a couple things. When I first started reading the Pittsburgh Courier, and this was actually during my master's study in, in Pittsburgh, um, one of the things that really struck me was that um, there were a lot of stories in the black press about how different allied nations were basically banning or calling for bans um, against the deployment of African American soldiers during the war years. And so this kind of caught my attention. Um, early on, and I just thought it was really fascinating because I never really realized that so many of our allies um, did not want us to take our race issues overseas. Um, and I guess because we're s more closely aligned with Britain in terms of, you know, our history comes out of Britain, we were once a colony, um, all those different factors kind of played into it, plus it was kind of nice to, 
travel Northern Ireland and <laughs> the UK in, in search of some of this, this research. Fracas? Fracas? That was like a big fancy word for like just fisty cuffs fighting in the streets. Okay. Yeah, like they had funny words for it back then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so the next time you see some fighting in the streets, that's a fracas. <laughs> yeah. I think it's also interesting to note, you know, even with the, the assignment of Benjamin Davis, um, to this position. He, I mean, he became a de facto expert on race relations, but one of the reasons that the Army did that was that they had nowhere else to put him. Because of their own regulations, they would not allow uh, an African-American officer to issue orders to a white officer. And so with this sort of like, you know, un, nowhere to really fit him, he ended up in, in the Inspector General's office um, and doing these inspection tours all over the U.S. Um, some of you may be more familiar with his son, um, Benjamin Davis Jr., who was the commander of the Flying Tiger, or the, the Red Tails, out of Tuskegee. Um, that was a movie not too long ago. Can you talk a little bit about the Davis archives? There are some really rich images oh. there, <laughs> location, access, things like that. Yeah, um, actually all of um, Davis's papers, his personal papers, are located at the U.S. Army War College in Carlisle, and there are um, incredible amounts of them. Um, uh, Marvin Fletcher, who had written a biography on Davis um, several years, uh, probably about two, two decades ago, he um, had donated all those documents to the Army War College, and so in there you find all kinds of really amazing things. He wrote letters, they've got copies of all his letters that he wrote to his family members while he was deployed. Um, there are little notes signed by Eleanor Roosevelt um, supporting him and his work. Um, there's letters written, um, there's an entire folder of just letters written by um, the mothers of, of service members whose sons were facing incredible discrimination and they would write to him and say, can you please help my son? Um, he's in a really rough place and no one's treating him fairly and it, it was just really fascinating. For anyone that's into that stuff, it's great. Yeah. From um, what I had noticed, that it was a lot of, like, I know one of the pictures, there was a lot of young black, black men. Uh huh. How old were they, like, when you entered? I mean, you'd, you'd have, um, it was this. Like, the one where they were in the line. Oh, it, that was at the very beginning, yeah. I mean, most of the soldiers that were in, you know, in World War II, I mean, yeah, there. Yeah, I mean, you know, as young as, as 18, 19, there were a lot of documented stories of men that, really boys that were like 15 and 16 and just really tall for their age that would lie just so they could enlist um, and serve. Um, it's possible, yeah. I mean, I think that for the Brits, you know, if you think about it, okay, so in the 1940s, it isn't like it is here today, right? We have access to British comedies, and they have access to our dramas, and, you know, there's, the world is very global. Back then, unless you saw it in a newspaper or read it in a newspaper magazine, you didn't really, or saw it on, on the big silver screen, that was the only way that you really had any access to Americans. Um, while I was in Northern Ireland, I did some um, oral histories with some um, elder, it was mostly elderly women because they laughed because all the guys had died off. But, um, <laughs> um, but yeah, so they were young teenagers and young women during World War II. And they remember when the Americans came. They said it was a really big deal. I mean, they were all so handsome and they had better uniforms and they had nice manners and they had more money so they'd buy them drinks and get them little gifts and gadgets and you know so like the Americans arriving there it was sort of like um, just this amazing whirlwind of just social activity suddenly and I mean if you think about it the men from Northern Ireland had all been off to war so they'd been gone for about two three years so suddenly they had people to dance with they had people to go out on dates with, to the movie house. It was a, it was a really big um, 
huge impact. Um, and that's one of the reasons why the Brits call it the American invasion, um, because we basically invaded them while we were waiting for the major um, campaigns of World War II. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, during, during this time period, in most, in most southern states in particular, but even in northern states, it was illegal to have a biracial relationship. You couldn't marry an African American. An African American could not marry a white. Um, there were laws in, in state legislatures banning that. So for a lot of people in the U.S., where you had Jim Crow laws that basically said where you can, what side of the sidewalk you can walk on, what s store you can shop in, where you can eat, where you go to school. All those things kind of, you know, created this environment where if you were a white Caucasian American, you could very well easily never really interact with any other of any sort, um, any person of color. And so, you know, when they came over to the UK, suddenly, they're finding these British women who see American, American uniform, American, and they're just like, you know, yeah, I'll go, I'll go on a date with you. Yeah, I'll go to the dance, you know. And for a lot of white males, especially um, southern white males, that was a real sticking point, and it caused a lot of friction. Um, I didn't talk about it here, but there was a huge um, village. There's a little village in just north of Manchester in, in England and um, it was called Bamber Bridge. And um, in the summer of 42, while Detroit and um, Harlem were melting down with racial riots, um, there was an incident there involving white MPs and a black uh, unit of soldiers attached to the Mighty Eighth Air Force. And um, they basically turned this little village into a shootout at the OK Corral for like 16 hours. And like when you walk down this village street, even today, you can still see pock marks from where the machine guns and the rifles, you know, were just gunfire everywhere. And um, in that incident, um, I think there was one that was killed, two that were very seriously injured. And, um, and it all started in a bar again. And in that particular case, when the MPs came in telling this one um, African-American soldier that he was out of uniform and he did not have a proper pass, basically the local villagers said, ain't no one getting arrested here tonight, so you better just move on, MP. And the MPs got really pissed, and so they drove up to the nearest town, got reinforcements, came back with their Tommy guns, and that's when all hell broke loose. So it was interesting to find that in, in Great Britain, a lot of times they saw the disparity and they um, came to the defense of the African Americans because they were really irritated by how a majority of, of white American soldiers um, treated them. And that's one of the reasons why I like this um, quote from one of the historians that I came across where he basically says that, you know, as, um, as historians, we have an obligation to um, acknowledge and recognize our country as it was rather than how we wish it had been, because we glamorize how we envision the greatest generation. And unfortunately, for many, many people that fought in that war, um, whether it was race or gender, those, those barriers have a very different, as a result of those barriers put up, there's a very different narrative that comes out of it. Um, and part of my argument is that that narrative is missing from our collective memory. Um, and that's an unfortunate thing. Um, honestly, when I was in the National Archives in um, Maryland, more times than not, 
it was it was more looking at the black and white race relations. Um, I think that you know there's historians out there, and thank God for them, that are looking at um, how Latinos and, and and also Asian Americans were handled during the war years. And that again is another one of those things where we have to acknowledge the wrong that was done. We can't just glamorize you know these. Hollywood biopics of, you know, the greatness um, that occurred because a lot of times that narrative is um, discriminates and it, it doesn't include, you know, minorities and it doesn't include women and those are those are narratives that we need we need to have researched and we need to talk about. Anything else? All right. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Pamela. Uh, and thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, we're having two events per month here in the Pettis Center. This is one of our continuing series. Please uh, check the calendar and, and come back and see us again. And also on your way out, uh, get some food to go. Thanks again. Thank you.